Romans 15, if you will. Romans 15. Um, we're going to jump in here where we kind of left off last time, verse 17. Work our way down through, uh, hopefully, verse 24. And we'll just get as far as we can here. The map on the overhead here is a map because we're going to be talking about this territory and so forth. And it's just really for reference. It saves me from having to try to draw it on the board, okay? Romans 15, if you will, uh, verse, uh, let's just start reading in verse 15. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written a more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Ghost. And, and again, Paul talking here about his unique ministry and about what is, uh, what, what he's, what, what, verse 17, I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. God is using the Apostle Paul to catch the attention of everybody, really, Jew and Gentile, of here's what I am now doing. I'm doing something different now. For 2,000 plus years, I've done nation of Israel, the Jews, the Jews, the Israel, 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 Israel. Now I'm doing something different where now we can, where I'm going to the Gentiles without having to go through the nation of Israel. And again, God is using the ministry of Paul to declare, this is what I am doing. He, if you look at verse 16, he talks about ministering the gospel of God. And we said last time, that's an umbrella term. If you'll notice the next word, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. That the gospel of God, the good news of God, a um, big term, and then a lot of, a lot of specifics, Gospels, Gospel of Christ, the Gospel of the Uncircumcision, the Gospel of, uh, uh, I just had it, the Gospel of the Grace of God, different, different things are going to pop underneath that. But then he says, here, look guys, that, the offering up. And Paul uses Old Testament terminology here in a very unique manner. About, the, about offering up the Gentiles, sacrifice. And again, you have to remember, Saul of Tarsus, also called Paul, understood the Old Testament Jewish religion immensely. He's the only one that would probably be, <laughs> he's the only one that I trust to know what he's talking about when I hear Gentiles try to talk about the Old Testament. Because... Gentiles don't know squat, as they say. Okay? Paul did. He's a studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He's a tri of the tribe of Benjamin. He's a Pharisee. He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He understood that, that rule of law, the Old Testament Mosaic law, better than any. So, what it, so he's using terminology here that the offering up of what did, they, what did the Jews do to that sacrifice? They, they would take that lamb, set it out there, watch it, make it blameless, make sure it's spotless, blameless. They would wash it. They would, cruci they would kill it, wash it, bring it to the priest. They would do everything. They, in other words, they dedicated the sacrifice to the service of God. What is a Gentile now? The Gentile is now dedicated to the service of God and is now usable. God is taking the Gentiles and that, that offering up to the issue of service. And God wants the Gentile liberated so that they can serve. That's why in Colossians he'll talk about having blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. He took, all, took care of all of that. Then in verse 17, which is where we were last time, Paul says, I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. All of this is what God is doing through Paul. His ministry to the Gentiles is, is God using Paul to, do, to declare 
This is what I'm doing. This is what pertains to me, to God. And when he does that, he's not, again, it's amazing to me. I, I just, I'm flabbergasted. I'm shocked. I'm astonished. What else can I be? That people skip over this and try to make Paul be, some, be the 12th apostle of the little flock and all this stuff when it's clear in the scripture is black and white. What's, what, what pertains to God? The fact that he's the minister of Jesus Christ to who? To the Gentiles. It's amazing to me. You don't have to like it. You don't have to, you can say, no, it can't be. But it's what God's word says. I know guys fight it. Oh, it can't be that. It's got to be this. got to be that. See this little, but yet the verses are very clear here. Come over with me to the book of Acts. It's fascinating that Peter, the chief, come over to Acts 11, the chief apostle, the guy in charge of the 12, of leading the little flock in, and he says, Paul's the guy. Paul's the man. You go to Paul now. In Acts 15, he's, he'll, in, the proclamate, in the meeting there, Paul gives Galatians 2. That's Paul's uh, viewpoint of the same meeting. And he says, hey, we Jews have to be saved like they Gentiles now. Now, Peter's a justified man. He's not talking about his, he's a member of the little flock, but he's talking about who? Unbelieving Jews out there now. So even Peter recognizes it, and yet we have people, men, leaders, don't know any better, don't want to know any better, don't want to know any, and yet here it is. But the thing is, in verse 17, is the things pertaining to God. Look at Acts 11. Notice Peter here. Peter is defending himself. He just went to Cornelius. By the way, who is Cornelius? He's a Gentile. You, you know the, the three sheets? It took three jerks of the sheet to get Peter to go. And Peter did what? It, it, it's, it's fascinating. When you look at what Peter comes over, look in Acts 10. It just Verse 9, on the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry, Acts 10.10, 10, and would have eaten. But while they were ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to Peter, kill, eat. I'm sorry, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, what? Not so, Lord. Why? Because he's not supposed to eat the unclean thing. And when the unclean touches the clean, the clean is now unclean. So we don't know. No, 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 no. That's the law. That's the rule. Verse 15, or verse 14, But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have neither eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now when Peter doubted, and where does he go? He goes, verse 23, he's in, he, uh, and on the morrow Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa and accompanied him, verse 24, and the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited, he went and saw Cornelius. That's where he was supposed to go. Verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that, Christ, that God now look, is no respecter of person. Was God in Israel's program a respecter of persons? Yes, he was. If you're a Jew, if you're of Israel, you're in. If you're not, you're out. That's a respecter. But what does Peter say now? God's what? God's changed the program. See, something different's going on here. Verse 35, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, isn't that an interesting verse? Look at what Peter preached to Cornelius. A works of righteousness gospel. See verse 35? What did Peter preach to Cornelius? 
Him that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. By the way, what does Titus 3, 5 say to you and I? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. This isn't our message. So Cornelius is not a member of the body of Christ. He's a member of the little flock. Oh, my goodness gracious. No kidding. Amazing what the Bible tells you when you read it. You know why most people are in apostasy, don't you? They don't read their Bibles. They read books about their Bibles. They don't read their Bibles. Verse 37, the word I say you now know, and it published, and and he goes out. If you keep following down there, whoops, I went too far. Verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were what? Oh my goodness, look at what just what happened to that Gentile. What's going on here, Pete? See, by the way, this is how you can, you can break your fool spiritual neck in the book of Acts. Because here, these guys just got saved, justified in Israel's program, without ever being baptized first. They got the Holy Spirit before they were ever water baptized. Now what do we do? Now Acts 2.38 is out the window. Now we got an issue. Well, well, they get baptized. By the way, verse 45, they were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter. Look at that. They got the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues. They haven't been baptized yet. Now you get it, verse 47, can any man forbid water? You see, if you just read, what do you got, what's going on? My point is, is Peter's in hot water here. So in Acts 11, he's called before the council. Look at verse 18, long way to get to here. (laughs) We might get somewhere today, I don't know. Look at verse 18, when they had heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto what? That's Peter. Okay? About this, you know what Peter's saying? These are the things that pertain to God. What just happened with between me and Cornelius back over here, guys, is what God wanted to happen. Again, he's not a member, he's not, Peter is not preaching. Faith and faith alone. How do you know? What did chapter 10 say? Works righteousness is accepted. Paul says no works to be accepted. See? So you come, come over to chapter 14. Now you got Paul. I'm, so Peter even says, me going and talking to the Gentiles, something's up, guys. Now, by the way, in Acts 7, that's where Israel falls, and that's where the dispensational change happens. Okay? In Acts 9, you have Paul on the road to Damascus. Here's my due time testifier. But in 10, again, think about the tremendous historical moment we're in. You've got Peter, the man, and the 11. So you got the 12. What does he, what, is, what do you think God has to do with Peter? I got to let him know something's different happening here. So, Pete, go talk to Cornelius. Go. By the way, you've got to study Cornelius. He was already a devout man, and he, he was already on board with the Jews' religion, if you, if you will. Okay? That's why he was sending to Peter to come and preach to him in his house, asking. So, Peter, the Lord educates Peter to a moment that I'm doing something different now. Now you got Paul on the scene, chapter 14. Acts 14, verse 27. And when they were come and they gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And again, that is without Israel in the, in the mode. Okay? Paul has been to Lystra, Iconium, Derby. He's been out doing ministry. He's out on his first apostolic journey. He's out going. And what does he say? This is what God is doing now. Chapter 15 and verse 3. 
and being brought by their way uh, by the church, they pass through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they cause great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. He's like, look, guys, we're out here ministering among the Gentiles. Why? Because that's the things pertaining to God. Come over to chapter 21. Chapter 21 of Acts. Acts 21. How's Acts 21? Oh, verse 19. Verse 18, and the day following, Paul went in with us unto James. By the way, that James is the half-brother of the Lord. He's the one that's in the Acts 15 agreement. He's the leader of the Jerusalem church there in Jerusalem. And uh, all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they what? glorified the Lord and said unto him. Now, how did they glorify God? When, they, when there was the recognition of the, of the Gentile ministry of the Apostle Paul. So when the church recognizes the, the, the Gentile ministry of Paul, who's going to get the glory? God. But who's, whose ministry are we having to recognize, acknowledge? That unique apostleship of Paul. See. Come over to chapter 26. Chapter 26. Chapter 26, verse 16. Actually, Acts 26 is Luke's account of Paul's eyewitness account of what happened on the road to Damascus. Okay? Paul is standing before Agrippa. So we're in a courtroom setting, if you will. Luke is sitting in the audience, being that great uh, companion of the Apostle Paul. He's writer of the Gospel of Luke, writer of Acts. And Paul stands, verse 13, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven. And he recounts Acts chapter number 9 on the road to Damascus. Verse 16, Here's what the Lord said to Paul. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a continuing witness and minister of the things which have been going on. Not at all. He didn't say that at all. What, what does... Now think about this. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ talking to Paul. Okay, Paul's recounting it to a Gentile king, and the Holy Spirit is using Luke to write it down. So I'm going to go with the book and not Dr. So-and-so. What does he say? I've appeared unto you for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people, that's Israel, and from the Gentiles. By the way, the people, that's unbelieving Israel. Let's specify, clar clarify that. And from the Gentiles, unto whom, notice that word, now. So when, does he, when is he commissioned? Not Acts 13, Acts 9. When's he converted? Acts 9. His conversion and commissioning is in Acts 9, not Acts 13. Okay, it's very interesting just how things, anyway, he goes on to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. So what was the one thing that he saw? Back up there, the things which thou hast seen. What did he see? He saw my gospel. He saw the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, what it meant, the meaning behind it. The event has been talked about since Genesis, but the meaning of it was always kept hid, kept secret. It was never revealed what it meant until who? Until Paul. And what else did he see? An inheritance among them that which are sanctified by faith that is in me. There's an inheritance associated with the justification. So again, when Paul, come over to 1 Corinthians 4. 
what's Paul doing? Paul is, hey guys, what I'm preaching and teaching in the book of Romans is the things that are pertaining to God. And you know what? Who cares who rejects this? We don't. This is what God is doing. It doesn't matter who out there accepts it or not. This is what he's doing. It's that simple. Oh, but Rick, what about this? No. This is what God's doing today in the age of grace, forming the church, the body of Christ. How? By faith alone in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And then he's got a heavenly destiny for us in the heavenly places. It doesn't matter if the room is full of people or not. This is what he's doing. Our job, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and the stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found what? That's what we're to be. See, so when you come back to chapter 15 of Romans, <clears throat> that's where Paul's at here. Paul is, again, all that matter is doing what God is doing, nothing else. It really doesn't. It's appointed unto man, what, once to die. When you die, you're going to leave how you came in with nothing. That's how you're going to die. So having the stuff, I love that in 1 Corinthians 7, he talks about uh, marriage. And he says, those that are married are going to have the cares of the world about them. So don't get married. So you don't, all you can do then is care about the Lord. And his, you know, I'm like, okay, Paul, you know, stick it in there, would you? Well, because what happens? You get married, and next thing you know, you've got to have a house. You've got to have a place to live. You've got to have this. You've got to have this. You've got to have that. And then when the kids come along, they have to eat. It's amazing. They've got to eat. So now we've got to feed them. You know, all this. And, and you know, that's, but that's what? That's the design of life that God had set for. So all that matters is what is God doing today? When we go out to the swap meet, we used to have a banner um, about uh, uh, the, your, it, it, uh, who is your apostle, question mark. And the reason for the question is to see what people, and you know what, a majority of them would say who? Peter. Well, what about Paul? Oh, Paul, Paul wasn't an apostle. Really? <laughs> the book says different. Oh, no, he was just a good guy. He just car- He picked up Peter's mantle and carried it on. No, he didn't. See. Romans 15, 17, I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ. Again, Galatians 6, 14, Paul says, I glory in the cross of Christ. Peter didn't glory in the cross. Peter's message with the cross was that it was a wicked thing. It was a bad thing. You killed the Messiah. You killed the king. And he's going to pay back. It's coming. <laughs> Paul didn't say that. Paul says, no, man, we preach Christ crucified. We preach that. Verse 18. For I will not dare. Now watch what Paul's, again, his unique apostleship. For I would not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. 18 and 19 and 20, they get abused by people, religionists, Christian dumb, D-U-M-B, okay? Because they yank them out. What are we talking about here? We're talking about Paul's context. His apostleship. And he says, hey, I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me. What did, I, I, what did Christ not wrought by Paul? Everything prior to Acts 9. Anything prior to, from Genesis to Acts 9, Paul says, that wasn't given to me. I didn't wrought it. I didn't bring it about. All that was by somebody else, another man's foundation. I start in Acts 9. Everything from Acts 9 forward was wrought by me. That's why when, and, and again, Romans 9, 10, and 11 has to come into mind, especially 11, 11, and 12, and so forth. What's happening there? 
did Paul do? Did Paul heal a guy? Yeah. Did Paul raise the dead? Yeah. Did Paul baptize? Yeah. Did he speak in tongues? Yeah. But why? By the way, none of that was wrought by him. That was all what? In going. So anything on the table when Paul starts eventually is going to do what? Diminish away. Everything that Paul starts from Acts 9 forward stays on the table. You follow that? So the sign gifts go away. The speaking in tongue, uh, the, the baptism, water baptism, he says in uh, 1 Corinthians, or uh, look at 1 Corinthians 1. Verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. By the way, if you look at his attitude about baptism, verse 13, it's been used to, to, by, the, by the people causing divisions to pat themselves on the back that, see, my, my baptismal cert certificate says the baptizer was Paul. Whose is yours? Now the guy goes, well, mine says Peter. Oh, well, okay, well, you know, whoa, 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 you know. And Paul's attitude is, is, I think, verse 14, God, that I baptize none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Baptism isn't the issue. Also, on top of that, 1 Corinthians is written in Acts 19. And from Acts 19 to the end of the book of Acts, Paul never baptizes another individual in the record. Why? Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. He got information that said, stop baptizing and go over here now. See that? But you learn that from 117, putting it where the book fits in Acts. So when you come back here to Romans 1, uh, 15, 18, for I would, not, I would not dare to speak of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me. What Paul is telling us is anything prior to Acts number 9, Acts chapter 9, is not for our obedience. Again, verse, verse 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our what? Learning. Learn about it. Study it. Understand why in the world did Israel even have water baptism? Because they are a kingdom of priests. And they had to have that. See? Why did they have this? Why would they say the signs belong to us? What are you doing over there? I mean, you go. I, Corinthians is full of this when they're doing something. The, the guy there, and and again, we're getting start First Corinthians in about eight months. Here, he, you, you, you caught that, didn't you? Okay, we got a chapter to go, and we got eight months to do it. So he says, Sosthenes, our brother, one one. Well, Sosthenes was the preacher of the synagogue, joined sitting next door to Corinth, the church of Corinth. How'd that happen? Well, what's going on at Corinth? Speaking in tongues, sign gifts, they got this stuff going on. And they're like, what are you doing our stuff for? Paul says, glad you asked. Come, let's see the dispensational here and see what's going on. And educate them up. Why? They're not, Sosthenes, those guys at the synagogue weren't believing remnant. They were unbelieving Jews. They were heathen. That's why in Galatians he says they gave I, that I would Paul would go to the heathen. Well, how did they get to be heathen? How did an unbelieving Jew become heathen? Acts seven. What did Stephen declare them to be? Uncircumcised in hearts and ears. What is what, to declare to, to declare someone to be uncircumcised? Genesis seventeen says you're outside of the agreement that God's making here. So you're on the outside. Yeah, but I've got it. It doesn't matter what is God doing, see. So he says, hey, we can learn it. And by the way, you ought to know it. We ought to know Genesis, the Revelation, forward, frontwards. And why? It's our, it's, it's our book. It's God's word to us. It's just not for us. We've got to get what's ours. We're learning it. And, and by the way, again, Paul knows something in chapter 16, verse 17. What's coming? An attack is coming. Verse 8, uh, Romans 16, 17, and 18. By good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. Paul knows that there's an attack coming. And what are they going to do? They're going to try to make you Acts 2. They're going to try to make you Matthew 10. They're going to try to make you Matthew 28. They're going to try to make you Mark 16. By the way, how you doing with the Drano? Have you tried any lately? Doesn't work. Better be dialing 911. 
sorry, how are you doing with holding that rattlesnake? By the way, in, in Revelation, it's a viper. It's not even a rat. I mean, even worse. <laughs> viper, there's no warning. He just hits you. So you see, so you've got, oh, Paul's like, guys, pay attention. Everything prior to Acts 9 is not on the table. Anything after, in anything more in Hebrews to Revelation is not on the table. The table is Romans to Philemon. And again, you go back to chapter 1, look back at Romans 1, Romans 1, 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. When Paul says you obey this, guess what he says? This is for your obedience. That's your learning. So in 15.8 here, when he says the things, I dare not speak of any of those things which Christ hath wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, he's like, We're, I'm not going back into stuff prior to Acts 9. And what's going to make the Gentiles obedient is by what? Word and deed. So the word. It's fascinating. In your scriptures, anytime there is a deed, a miracle, a miraculous event, it is designed to do only one thing, to validate the word preached. That's all it's ever going to do. You never find a miracle, whether the Lord does it or who does it, that isn't preceded by the preaching of a message. So the word... That's the preaching, the doctrines committed to Paul, the things that Paul is teaching and preaching. And again, Paul's not around in the beginning of Acts. We can learn this. By the way, there's real a lot of rich stuff in the Old Testament. Okay, we uh, Linda uh, teaching the kids about Elijah, and so we're talking about Elijah. I, I don't know if you ever paid attention to old Elijah. And the widow's might, and the widow's son, and not the widow's might, but the widow's son. Why in the world is that thrown right in the middle of it? And then you start digging in, and an hour or two later, you're like, okay, I need to go back to the ball game because my head's spinning here. Why? Because it's just rich, full of information. But we have to view it through what? The Pauline lens. We're not to obey that. You can't look in the sky and say no rain for three and a half years. By the way, as soon as you do that, you know what it's going to do? Rain. That's what, at least in my house it does, okay? You can't do that. You know why Elijah could do it? It's what God was doing, and God told him to go tell Ahab that. That's rich. It's wonderful to see and to know. So the word here, obedient by word, that's the word being preached by the Apostle Paul to the Gentiles. What was he preaching? You guys have the access to forgiveness now? It's through by faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, my gospel. And, oh, by the way, there's an inheritance associated with all that that's wonderful, and I'm going to get more of it, and as I get more of it, I'm giving it to you. That's why in, in Acts, they, the Gentiles were glad. Oh, that, look, glad to hear this. Then verse 19. So you've got, because he says, by word and deed. And the deed is verse 19, through mighty signs and wonders by the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem, and that's why the map, so you go Jerusalem's down there in the bottom, and round about unto Iliacrum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Okay? So this is, verse is loaded again. Mighty signs and wonders. These signs done by Paul... They have a unique purpose. Okay? Come over with me to 2 Corinthians 12. What, is, what also is the word that Paul is preaching here, especially in, in uh, Romans 15, in the context, is about his unique apostleship. Could you imagine? Here stands up this guy, Paul, and he says, I am now the Gentile I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. Could you, that, thus, the bold statements. I've written them more boldly under you. He stands up 
in the middle of the synagogue, as his manner was, where he goes first to the synagogue, and he says, I am the apostle of the Gentiles, and the whole room goes silent. And then the Gentiles on the perfume go, yeah, that's our man, woohoo! You know? What's by word? By the way, who gave him the word? The Lord Jesus Christ does, see? And he begins to preach the word. But then it's done by the deed. The deed to back up the word, to validate his apostleship. For 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Paul is doing the signs of a who? Of an apostle. Chapter 11, verse 5. For I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostle. That's Peter. He's, he had the signs of an apostle that caused the Gentiles to listen to his word and to believe his word, and that was backed up by signs that authenticated his apostleship. You follow that? Come back to Mark 16. You've got to catch this. Again, and I'm kind of stressing on this because people abuse Romans 15, 17, 18, 19 here and say, see, Paul was out doing signs amongst the Jews and blah, 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 and a Gentile got to see it and blah, and all this stuff. And it's just, it's no, that's not what's happening here. Okay? Now, does he do signs amongst the Jews? Yes. Do the Gentiles see it? Yes. But that's not the context of Romans 15. The context of Romans 15 is here's my unique apostleship because this is what God's doing and it's been validated here. Mark 16, verse 20. And they, now that they here, this will be the, the, the uh, 11 because Judas is gone. They went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. There's the 11, they're out. Judas is gone. They haven't got the 12th Matthias on board yet. And what are they doing? They're out preaching. By the way, what are they pre preaching? Kingdom of heaven's at hand. Repent. Let's get her right. You got to get right. You got to come out of that untoward generation. You got, he's preaching Acts 2. They go in, and what's the Lord doing? He's confirming them with what? With signs. You go look at Luke 8. Look at Luke 8, verse 1. 8, verse 1. Fascinating verses here, folks. Luke 8, verse 1. And it came to pass afterward that he, and that will be the Lord, went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom. And the twelve were with him. What's he preaching? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then the signs come by, and the two great signs of the kingdom are healing the sick and casting out the unclean spirits. What's he doing? When you see, the, when you see this happening, the sick being healed and the unclean spirits being cast out, Isaiah says, and you know God is with you, and he's in your midst. And what's he preaching? I am him. I am Jehovah. I am the great I am. And he's doing the signs to confirm it. Come over to Acts 14. So with Paul, what's he doing? He's, he doesn't have scripture, folks. Acts 14. Paul hasn't written a book yet. If anything, he might have written Thessalonians, and we'll get over there and I'll show you that in just a second here. So what he, he's out here doing. <laughs> so what confirms his word to be that of what God is doing? A sign has it's, it's shown. Acts 14, look at verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium, by the way, Iconium is up the coast there, okay, that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude, now watch, both of Jews and also of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Now, all right, you see that? So Paul and Barnabas, they go in, they're preaching. They're preaching to who? Jews and Gentiles, Greeks. Some of, some of them believe. 
They believe Paul's gospel. They believe his apostleship. They're on board. Then the unbelieving Jews come in and say, wait a second, and they stir the pot. Now look at verse 3. Long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hand. In the context, where is Paul? He's in that unbelieving synagogue of the Jews. And what's he doing? He's preaching. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. He's preaching God has set you guys aside. You're not his people anymore. You're a sinner. You're lost. You're on your way to hell. And they're like, huh? Who? How dare him speak that to us? So it riles them up. But what confirmed it? The signs. So the Gentiles can look back over there. They can witness something that is happening through the signs and the wonders being demonstrated by Paul, that that is the Word of God and that that's what God is doing. If you write down 1 Thessalonians 2, well, just hold on to Acts. Just look at 1 Thessalonians 2. Hold on to Acts because we need Acts 15. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Thessalonians and Galatians are the two earliest books of Paul, okay? So if you say Thessalonians was written first, fine. If you say Galatians, fine. It, it, I have my, I, I think Galatians, and that's just because of what's in the book and so forth. But look at Thessalonians, okay? For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the word of God which ye, what? Heard of us. So they heard Paul preach at Thessalonica, all right? You, you, you remember Acts 18 uh, when they're uh, going through and they're fighting and they're running and so forth. Then watch what he says. Ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. How did they receive the word coming out of Paul's mouth as the word of God? How did they do that? They could have, it could have just, he could, Paul could have just been one of the other philosophers of the day spewing garbage. But he does, how did they know that it was the Word of God? What did Paul do? He did a little signs over here that backed, that confirmed, that validated that what he was doing was true. Do you follow that? Acts, Acts 15. By the way, Acts 17, that's when they're at Thessalonica and Berea and so forth. You know, they're doing there. Mars Hill, they see all that. Acts 15, if you look at verse 12, Then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Isn't that interesting? That's just among the Gentiles. He's teaching the Gentiles something. He's teaching the Gentiles that God isn't working directly through the Jew anymore. He's over here working through the mediator, the man, Christ Jesus now. And you know what? That made the Gentiles exceedingly joyful. <laughs> Chapter 19 of Acts. Acts 19. Acts 19, verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Isn't that interesting? Special miracles. They were validating his claim as the apostle to the Gentiles, and they were validating something about what God is doing now in the dispensation of grace. And again, Acts can mess you up. Just read it and understand. If you want to understand what Paul is doing, and why Paul is doing what he's doing, you never go based off of Acts. You go find what he's doing in Thessalonica, in Corinth, in Galatia, in Rome, and you go read those books, and Paul will tell you what he's doing in the corresponding Acts chapter. You follow that? So if I want to know why he's, why in the world is he speaking in tongues? I don't care about Acts. I know where it's at. But I go read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and guess what I find out? Here's why. Okay? I go read Romans 11, 11, a provoking ministry that he had. 
not of the circumcision. Paul never talks to the circumcision in a doctrinal, you need to be doing this manner. He talks to that heathen. See. Now come back to Romans 15, verse 19. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Iliacrum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now, that's why the map's up there, so you get an idea. Well, the map went away. Okay, it's been up there all morning, all right? And because J Jerusalem, all the way up through, through uh, uh, Palestine, through Turkey, Greece, uh, Asia, Macedonia, all the way to Italy. Now, Paul hasn't been to Rome yet. He's on his way to Rome, okay? By the way, if you look, so he's getting there. He's not quite there yet, but he's on the way there. Now, watch ver the end of verse 19 carefully. I have fully preached the gospel of God. He didn't say that. It says what? Gospel. See how he changed because the gospel of God was what? That the Gentiles are now acceptable. But when Paul is preaching in his ministry, he, he's now preaching something very specific. Do you remember another verse in Romans that talks about the gospel of Christ? 116. Romans 116. You see, Paul here now, in the context, now Paul's talking about something a little more specific that was given to him and him alone. 116, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to who? To everyone that believeth. You see, the gospel before had to go through who? The Jew? They're the sons of Abraham, therefore they'll be justified. The gospel was preached to them. Why? Because they're of Abraham. Now it's to who? Everyone that, what? Believes. See that everyone, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, many, to the many, 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 Paul is like, nope, it's an all, 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 okay? Now, by the way, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, when we went through this three years ago, I, and so you ought to remember, okay, why did he go to the Jew first? Why does, as his manner was to go to the Jew first? Because they were very familiar with the Word of God, the, of God. So that would have should have clicked. The Gentile is not. The Gentile's on the outside looking in, going, What's the Word of God? A little more time there, okay? Romans 15, verse 20. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Now, again, nothing prior to Acts 9. So we're not preaching John the Baptist's message. We're not preaching the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. We're not preaching the 12. We're not preaching Peter and his Acts ministry. We're not preaching the... Not a continuation of that information and ministry, period. Another man's foundation. By the way, 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says... I'm the master builder. I've laid the foundation. And who's the foundation? You remember? Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is the foundation of all of it. Ephesians 1.10. <laughs> He's the head of all of it. But the foundation has two, two rooms on it. It's got Israel, and they're a pro prophecy program. And now Paul says, I got a mystery program, and we're not built on that foundation over there. We're built over here on this information. Thus the gospel of Christ. Okay? He's not saying that it was wrong to preach where someone else preached. You hear that every now and then. He didn't go up into Galatia because Peter and them, no. By the way, he, Paul does that quite a bit. Goes and preaches where the other guys have been. All right? His desire was to reach as many people as he could. So, verse 21, what's he, he quotes Isaiah 52, But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. And that's the attitude in which Paul was preaching. You know what? Everybody's going to hear this message. And I'm going to get out there. So, verse 22, For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you, 
But now, having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. You know what Paul says? I'm out here doing the cares of the church daily. I'm out here doing ministry. I'm out here going, and I want to come see you. And what's driving me is that everybody's going to hear this message. So I've been a little busy. That's the hindering. There, for which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. Yes, it's also the satanic attack, but why is the, why is the adversary, by the way, the adversary, he attacks the Lord, Peter, the little flock, and in Acts 9, you know where he goes? Right over to Paul. If the devil can get it right, then why do we have such problems as humans? a rhetorical question now you think about that the adversary knows what god's doing paul says i've been much hindered what held him back was all the ministry work that then results in the adversarial attack against him when he's got the lewd men of the baser swords the mobs after him now because of the jews the government's after him because of the jews he just couldn't hop a Tesla and get over there. They didn't have, you know. He couldn't, he, he did go by boat quite a bit. But he also went by camel and he also went by Reebok. Footwear, treading, okay. He, uh, he did. So it's not that he was like, I just can't get there, blah, blah, blah. He, he's like, look, what's holding me back, guys, is, is I want to come and see you. Also... The indication here is, is that the church at Rome wasn't started by his presence. It was started by folks that had come into Rome. Rome's the capital of the, of the world at the time. And people had migrated there, and guess what they did? They did what Paul said to do. You get there, get some, saved, get some unsaved saved, get, get some edification, and start a local church. And that's what they did. Okay, and Paul, and Paul knows that. And again, Paul recognizes his presence isn't needed. What's needed? The Word of God. Okay. Much hindered. Again, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. the care of the church is daily. Now, verse 23, what's he want to do? But now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you. By the way, many years. They're not a new church. They've been going a while. Isn't that interesting? They've been up and running. He desired to see him. He just wanted to see him. If you come back to chapter 1, I think about this. Verse 10, making request, if by any means, now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you, for I long to see you. I mean, he just, he, he loved being around the saints. And he wanted to get there. He wanted to see them. Okay. Then he says, verse 24, whensoever I take my journey into Spain. Now, that's forward planning. Paul was a planner. Paul had priorities. Paul had, I'm going to go here, then I'm going to go here, then I'm going to go here. And he, he, he had a 10-year plan, and, act, and he, he planned for 10 years and lived like the Lord was coming back in the moment. He, he was, where am I going? I'm going to Spain. I'm going over there. Now, whether he got there or not, we don't know. All right? Some of the historians say he did, but your scripture is silent. So you know what we're going to be? Silent. When the book's silent, folks, your safe bet's to be silent. Now, you can, hype, you can read Josephus, and you can read Philetus, and you can read the boys and all that stuff, and, you know, but that doesn't mean anything. Now, personally, when he says in Timothy, I finished my course, and Spain is on his mind to go, he might have got there. Scripture's silent, so we'll just leave it at that, okay? But what's he want to do? Having a great desire these many years to come unto you, I will come. Now, verse 24, because it's going to set up the rest of the what we're going to look at now. I will come, for I trust to see you in my journey. I'm in 1524 and to be brought on my way thitherward by you. I'm coming to see you guys, to get refreshed by you, so that you can then send me on the next leg. 
on the next journey, part of the journey, which is to go where? To Spain. Okay? By the way, the histor historical record of the book of Acts indicated that he didn't get there. <laughs> but we don't know that. Acts 28, the way it ends, it leaves it open. All right? But, again, Scripture's silent there. He's coming. He has goals. He wants to get to the, to the saints at Rome. He says, I'm going to be there a little while. Verse 24, I'm going to be refreshed by you. And then you guys can, I'm going to raise a little, I'm going to raise an offering and we can get to the next bet, next side. And how you know that, he says, I have somewhat filled with your company, but now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it have pleased them of Macedonia, okay, to make a certain, notice, contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. So Paul now, the rest of the chapter, is going to talk about a special, a, a special financial situation that has arisen because of the dispensational change and program change amongst the, poor, amongst the saints at Jerusalem, the little flock. And we're going to do verse 25, 27. It pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is, is also to minister unto them in carnal things. And we're going to dive into that because the hour's up, but, and I had planned on that. But the thing is, is now Paul is going to begin to talk about really the, 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 the fruit of faith, the fruit of grace here. And this demonstration from the Gentiles back towards that little flock of how we understand His grace and what He's done, and we rejoice in it, and so we're going to do this, okay? But the issue here is how, as he's ending the books, he wants, to, he, he wants us to see some things here. So he's going to have to divert his travel plans to go where? To Jerusalem first. Then the plan is to come to Rome, and then Rome to send him the next leg, okay? And we'll get into verse 24 through that next time, all right? Just kind of catch Paul's, he says, look, guys, here's my unique apostleship, and you know why? Because there's a fair, good words and fair speeches coming, there's an attack coming, and it's going to be on my apostleship, and you need to be on board, Okay? All right, now, real quick, passing comment, and then you can go get some more coffee and wake up. All right? The book of Romans is not the first book written by Paul. It sits in the first epistle in the edification process. However, all of the information in Romans, Paul has been preaching since Acts 9. All along. That's why there is not a great detail about, in Romans 12, about the sign gifts. We do that in Corinthians. There's not great detail about the judgment seat of Christ. We do that over here in Corinthians and, and in Timothy. He just does what? Brings up the topic. That's all the information he has. Boom, he gets it. So the issue of justification has been going on since day one. The issue then of learning to grow into a walk, identity, Romans 6, Day one. The issue then of the uh, not Israel, not a spiritual Jew, etc. Day one. Why? Look at what God's doing. And so, and then 12 to 6, day one. I say that because sometimes people think, well, he wrote this late 20, so none of this information was flowing. No, it's been flowing since day one. He's been preaching the word, and then he's the, the sign, the, the deeds validated. Okay? All right, work through that, would you? Okay, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word, for the instructions here. And above all, Lord, we thank you for the Apostle Paul, for his ministry and message to, to us today, for your grace to extend the day of grace another day. And we thank you for that. So whatever we say and do will be honor and glorifying to you and that we would walk worthy of you. In your name we pray.